two party people in the place to be. Welcome to the Museum of Graffiti Art Talk. I am Brimstone, and tonight we have a very special guest by the name of Trek Six. It is going to be an amazing interview, and I hope that y'all are ready to learn some sweet hip hop history and to get it cracking without the crack, because that's what we are here to do. So without further ado, my brother Trek Six has created a vast and unique body of work that spans over three decades, a diversity of mediums and multitudes of cities and cultures. Tonight we will discuss growing up in Miami through the 80s and 90s and the duality between being traditionally schooled in art versus his graffiti writer upbringing and much, much more. So I know we just had a little technical difficulty. It's all love out here, but we do know that right now, hopefully with the help of the Most High, we will get him in the building get this thing cracking. So without further ado, can y'all please make some noise for the one and only, my brother, Trek Six, y'all. Make some noise for Trek Six. Come on, come on, come on. Duels, what up? STV crew is definitely in the building. Salute from Los Angeles. What up? What up? What up? Dave, what's going on? Ket, what's up? What's up? So, Bash, you are, you are in the building. Yes, yes, y'all. Can y'all hear me loud and clear? Just let me know that my audio is working, please. Jono, what up? What up? Sweet Tooth Scully, what up? Rex, what's going on? What's going on? Bash, you already know. All right. So let's just make sure we get the audio right and we get this thing going and going and going. By the way, while you're in here, please support by purchasing a chat, uh, pur purchasing a badge. You can click on it. What up, duels? You can click on it and get a badge. And we got Trek One in the building and he is now joining our chat. Let's see what's up, Trek Six. Let's go. Okay, we have to run this again. He's not able to join. Anyway, how many of you know what's, what's popping with Miami, Florida right now, man? Who's getting up? Who's bombing? Who's taking it to the streets right now? Who is doing their do? What up, duels? Who is doing it? Drop it in the chat and let's go. SK, what's going on? We see you. We see the crew. We see all of you. And we are here to rock it without stopping because that's what we came to do. Introducing my brother, Trek Six. What up, Path is in the building. And for those of you that have missed it, you are tuning in live to Art Talk on the Museum of Graffiti. So we are, we got Yes, it. we are on, got my brother, Trek Six is in the building. It's Here all we go. good. We've been through audio problems before, man. So let's just, let's just jump right in because oh. it's time, man. Right. We got the one and only Trek Six in the building. How you feeling today, my brother? Bless, you hear me good? Hear you well. Can the crew can the crew in the Museum of Graffiti chat hear us? Ars Key, what up? Can y'all hear us? Trek, go ahead. Y'all hear me? Yep. Loud right. and clear. All right. We're good then. We're Yo, good. so we're, we're gonna take it back, man. You've been in Miami now. Tell us where are you from? Where were you born? And where did you spend the most of your, your childhood life growing up? Originally from from Puerto Rico, from Santurce. Is where I'm really from, uh, but my father was in the armed forces, so we traveled quite a bit, and uh, I ended up in Homestead in 1980, I say 84, around that, and then ended up in Richmond Heights, and then pretty much been there ever since. So we are going to take you through some early work of Trek. This was one of your first collaborations with our brother Wheel, and. Um, we're just going to look at the development, how you've developed, you know, over the years with your style, with your characters, with your 3D and all that. So whatever comes to mind as we search through these things, feel free to share. I mean, that might have been like my second or third time I've ever drawn this ray paint ever. Word. What, um, year, so what year did you start painting and who was up? Who inspired you to get involved in graffiti art? I, I first learned about graph in about 85, 86. I had a, a cousin and she like she was like really into Chico's. And so she used to babysit me and I looked up to her, you know, like a little kid would. And I got really jealous of this one Chico she was dating and I stole his book bag and inside he had like a, an English book and it had all this like ill hand style stuff. And I, you know, I wanted her to you know, think I was cool. So I started copying that stuff and learning how to write, but I didn't know anything about graffiti. I, it wasn't like I really like even noticed it on the walls yet. Um, it wasn't until a couple of years later when I went to Arvida uh, that I really started kind of like getting into it. And, um, and that was because I was trying to find this guy who wrote Mend at the time who ended up being a uh, wheel 33. And him and I had been from that point, you know, just partners in, in crime for 
for up until now. He's still my homie to this day. And there it is. You got Wheel 33 right there on the top of the wall, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. And so here's a collaboration between me and you, actually. Um, yeah. But I want to just really focus on your character because you were definitely the cat in the crew that was rocking characters before any of us. So tell us what inspired you to go the route of characters really before letters. You know, you were really working on developing your art skills. You know, I, I, at first I really liked the letters, not the characters, because I was an art school kid. So everybody did characters in art school. Um, so I found letters to be kind of like refreshing. But that that at the time that those photos were happening, I was learning how to airbrush from mirror. And um, and I can't say enough about the influence that guy had on 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 how I viewed graph and, and just technique in general. But um, but yeah, so Mir was doing, you know, Mir had some really advanced characters and it just started picking up on me like, hey, man, you know, maybe I should look more into doing more characters and doing things that are more like the stuff that I drew in black books, you know, um, and then those in particular is when I started freestyling characters. I, I, you know, I thought that like carrying the, the picture of the what I was going to draw on me, I thought was kind of whack sometimes. And so that a lot of that stuff, it was just, you know, I don't know, I get drunk or whatever, go hang out trackside and have some paint. And um, I remember back then those were when uh, the Krylon clear coats, because we didn't have, we didn't have, we didn't too many places to get caps back then. So what, what I used to do was use the Krylon clear coats. I used to jack them from pearls, and um, and yeah, the raw funk. <laughs> that's that's the back of Killian, 1993. I did a, a did a lot, quite quite a lot there. <laughs> I did all the raw funk at the bottom, the Killian, um, the characters, you know. And, and I shared with you that story earlier on that that was like my first like gig, gig that I got paid for. Um, mm -hmm. but it was, it was kind of a scam in which, uh, I scammed to get the paint and ended up with the receipt and then turned around and said to the principal that for me to do that mural, it cost me X amount of, you know, money and paint. And so the principal then reimbursed me for the paint. So I racked like 300 cans plus came up on the loot, you know, so overall, I think it was, it was a pretty good, good and night. It's, it's crazy because Killian was considered the school by the graffiti task force that had the most graffiti writers of any school in all of Miami-Dade County. And here, here in my handwriting, it says, stay in school because you are the future, Killian Cougars, and a few of us from STD to and beyond were a bunch of dropouts. So yeah. it just shows you. But I love this piece. I mean, you see your characters next to the wheel, mm -hmm. the character right next to the raw, the funk, uh, you know, the, the, what you did with the trash can and the light next to it. It's just a, it's a brilliant piece, man. And um, yeah, well, you and I went through a phase where we were like drawing trash cans and, and lights and fire hydrants. And like the most random street obstacles. Yeah. <laughs> was, yep. that. Oh, this was. Yep. And yo, and thank you, y'all, that are purchasing badges. We really appreciate the support. What up, Dun One? What up, Twice Ski in the place to be? So we're gonna. So where is this piece? And tell us the. How did you? How did your style develop from this raw funk style that you did here mm -hmm. to now here? Well, the, when I was doing the raw funk stuff, um, my view on graffiti was very different. You know, it it was. It was more like something that I did when I was with my friends uh, and to, you know, I don't know, I maybe I felt like a Billy Badass when I was doing it. I don't know what the, what, really what it, what it is, but it wasn't, I was looking at it as it like necessarily as like an art form, even though at, at that time I was actually traveling and I traveled both to, to France, New York and Puerto Rico and was already doing um, murals uh, for like clubs and stuff like that. But I just, for me, graph, I liked it raw. And then as I got older, I started appreciating more technique um, and style and flair and, you know, the different things you can actually do with the aerosol. Um, and just in learning Which, more about how the actual can works and what I could do with the can, um, really, I was able Shrek, to Yeah. Shrek, real quick, if you, if you can turn your camera off and turn it on again, please, or maybe you have to unjoin and join. People say they can't see you. They can't see me. Okay. Yeah, they can't oh. see you. And as we go through it, it's okay if you want to disconnect and join back in. Are we back? Yeah, just disconnect and join back in, and let's see if that'll. Oh, continue. it was so hard to do it. Let me see. And, uh. and while we wait for the one and only Trek Six to to uh, make this thing happen here, 
We are going to continue to go live. Thank you so much for being with us on Art Talk, the Museum of Graffiti in the building. Please show your support to Trek, STV, CBS crew, WH crew by purchasing a badge. That would be a great help. And we will see if we can get him right back in here. I want to give a big shout out to the Museum of Graffiti for allowing us the opportunity to document Miami's hip hop culture and Miami's graffiti scene. It's a blessing to be able to tell this story and actually have it for all of y'all to learn about. So hopefully we'll get Trek back in. If y'all, as soon as he joins, if you could let us know, is he, um, he's here. Can you see his video? Can y'all see Trek? Please let us know. Aim in the building, done one, what up? Can y'all see, can y'all see Trek? We are live art talk with Trek. Can y'all see him? So we can keep it going. We're good to go. Okay, Trek. So people are asking this piece right here. What year is this? Oh, I'm, I'm the worst with dates. That's the the 25 year WH reunion. Big up Word. My, my my Dubs family. Word. 25 like, years. Yeah. Of writing history. Yes, no right. doubt. That's right. 25 years. Can you believe that? I, I thought it was the day for like getting stoned and hanging out at the, you know, penance. Word. <laughs> okay. Now you just brought up penance. Tell yeah. us a little bit about penance. What are what is a penance and what which one did you enjoy going to the most? Penance of Miami term. Um, I mean, essentially they're just building abandoned buildings where everybody's you know practicing at. Uh, Alan says I'm gone. Am I gone? Or am I still here? Oh, oh, no, here, no. Said you're gone again. Um, I see. I see you. I see you too. I mean, I see what you have up. Let's um let's try one more time. Disconnect and log back in. Ask okay. to join. Sorry about this family, but this is what it is. This is li this is shows you how live we are at Art Talks Museum of Graffiti. We go right. live. Right. They hear you but can't see you. Just make sure you have a good internet connection. And um, yeah. let's let's try it again. Thank you, fam family, for joining us. We get through these technical difficulties just like we get through the difficulty of COVID and the rest of them things that are out there. And we're going to do it again. We're going to bring on our friend Trek Six and keep documenting this hip hop culture and keeping it live. Thank you so much for rocking with us, y'all. Can't stop, won't stop. You already know. All right, we see you. Can y'all see Trek? Am I back? Not back. Can y'all see Trek? I hear you and see you. I, I mean, on my end, I, everything seems cool. All right, they say you're back. So if anything, they say, if we can't hear you, we're just gonna keep it moving because we can, We can. I mean, if we can't see you, we hear you. What up, KV, what up? Yeah, I'm, All right. on my end, it looks solid. Inter Internet's looking solid, signals looking solid. Oh yeah, that's my Vipers. Big Talk up to, to my CB. That's from uh, Barbecues and Burners. It's an event we throw, uh, in Asheville, you know, we do it once a year. Me and me and a lot of the CBS uh, Lords homies, um, and yeah, man, that's that's one of my cobras. We did it for one year. Yeah, I don't really know what's going on with with the internet here. Maybe if I move closer to a window, I don't know. Maybe now. You hear me, Bram? I hear you fine. Yeah, I hear you loud and clear, and I I'm can just, see you. They I'm said they can to... hear you, so let's keep it rolling. All right, all right, cool. So yeah, uh, that was just another weekend also painting with the WH family. But again, it's just, you know, the cans nowadays are so different. It, you know, you can, man, you can really just do so many different things with it so easily. And what kind of paint, what kind of paint you use and what was the transition like going from, you know, regular Rustos and Krylons to all the fancy paint that's out nowadays? I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like, <laughs> too easy with the with the new shit i mean the new paint to be honest um you know if you had if you had real kind control back then when you pick up one of these new cans now it's like you don't even have to worry about being rusty it just automatically is there um the technology is totally totally different uh and in the, and you know having the different the variable pressures and you know even caps because i'll be honest uh, most of my early graph stuff i never had caps like I would rack, you know, little caps here and there, and I would keep them inside the, the little uh, uh, containers where you had your photograph, your photo film in, and I'd have that filled with like a cleaner, 
and I would all the time just be jiggling it around and jiggling it around and jiggling around, cleaning, you know, the one or two caps that I've been holding on to for like six months. So we're, we're rubbing alcohol, right? Yeah. 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 So, you know, I, I pretty much left spray paint alone. Uh, I would say around 1998 ish was the time that, that, that I, I, I just stopped working with aerosol altogether. Matter of fact, I stopped painting period um, for a while. And, um, and when I went back, back to it, uh, big up to, to my cousin, uh, Bick, you know, my cousin Bick was painting down in La Bella in Puerto Rico. And he was doing a lot of like, uh, you know, the places where they, where they sell different herbs and, and, and Coke and stuff. And he, he's like, yo, I need, I need your help on this. Can you know, you just real quick, come down with me and, and just hang out with me. And I saw that they had, uh, he had Spanish Montana. And that was actually the first time I'd ever touched it. And it was just like, uh, I couldn't believe it. You know, mm -hmm. I was just floored by how simple it was, you know, to use that, that paint. And I didn't see it again until, um, until I bumped into G in uh, Wynwood because G actually had the first paint shop. If I, I might be, I don't know if I'm wrong, but if, if, I'm, if I'm correct, uh, G South had the first paint shop in Winwood, the sole spray paint. Right. Um, but it was kind of a download thing. I don't know if he, if it was something that he advertised or anything. It could have been just a warehouse. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, but, he had, it was kind of on the DL. It was right, right around the right, corner from, from right. the wall that faced out of the uh -huh. And that's yeah. the next time I saw Fancy Paint again. And coincidentally, that was also the time I met Chore. And that led to a, a lot of other, you know, collaboration. Oh, that's, that's a classic there. Yeah, let me just say, Mama Dave, thank you for purchasing a badge. I love this piece because it's like sexy chic graffiti. You know what I'm saying? And it's a collaboration between Trek Dar and SK545, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. T t tell us a little bit about the process of how the collaboration went down and how y'all worked together to complete this piece. This was okay. from Wynwood, right on the corner of Northwest 2nd Ave and maybe, what do you say, like in the 20s somewhere? Yeah, yeah, something like that. I don't remember the exact street number, but um, I believe this was SK's wall. If I remember correctly, um, I don't I don't remember the details of how I got on it. Uh, I know that I had done a couple of other like um, renderings for it on a computer, and I never really do renders, which is really weird. And I did some of SK, and I'd run it through this uh, 3D software and like chromed it out so that I can get the chrome like solid and perfect. And then um, I had picked this flamenco dancer because I thought like, you know, the whole street art thing was happening was like really starting to take in Winwood. But I didn't want the graph thing to like fall like second place. So I wanted to both have them both like juxtaposed next to each other and, and keep it that way. And so I was going to draw this girl, girl the, the dancing girl. But then last minute, I didn't want to do the rendering. I don't remember why I didn't want to do the rendering. And I had suggested to Dar, like, instead of doing fills, like, why don't you just leave her, her dress as the fill? But I had already painted the dress. So it's kind of hard if you think about it. And like much respect to, to Dar and SK because they had to throw that up without messing up too much because I had already done the dress. Right. So they, they had to go and cut the outline. And then you I don't know if you can really see it in here, but there's actually a drop shadow underneath the outline. It makes it look like it's popping up off her dress. And so, yeah, man, like it, it's one of those things that like, it looks really simple. Like when you just look at it, you know, like, it, but it, the, there's a lot of technique there. I mean, there's a lot of technique. Word. I de Definitely is a beautiful piece, man. Beautiful piece. Ah, the collective. So, so your STV and WH and CBS crew, just tell us a little bit about, you know, what those crews mean to you and how you got down with each one and who are, you know, who are some of the writers that mentored you through those processes? So, so STV, <clears throat> like we discussed uh, uh, privately in another conversation, I don't think I ever officially was told, like, you're in the crew. I think there was a crew called LMV. And LMV was me, Wheel, Rook, Own, and Twice. And we were kind of like the like, like the gateway to being an STV, I guess. And so at the time, I think STV was Stir, Rage, You, Much, and Boost, if I remember correctly. And, um, and so, yeah, you know, Twice got put into STV. I think Wheel got put into STV. And then you and I were doing the hip hop thing with Plan B. And I just think me, Rook, and Owen just kind of slid in. Maybe Owen got asked. I'm not too sure. But I think we just kind of slid in, in on that. And, uh, and we wrote out. We wrote out. We, we put it down. And, and, and we, you know, we made a life thing. 
Um, WH was a little different for me. I don't think I like there was an official like, oh, you're part of WH. It was just one of those things that a lot of the people who were part of STV but came from like the old school, I don't know, I want to say the old old school gangster side of, of Kendall. We seem to kind of all, almost all click together a little bit differently. Um, and those were seemed to me like the earlier guys of, of WH. You know, we all had either a 154 or IMP background, a lot of us. Um, and so we just, it just seemed like it was that. But, um, but both these crews were one thing when I was in it and then became a completely entirely, you know, and I'm not, I'm saying this in the most um, jealous way possible, became like, like really something really amazing afterwards. Right. So, so, you know, I was at like this very early kind of cusp um, formation time for those crews. Uh, which were, I think, were very essential, especially for STV coming from being a, a, a conglomerate to being in your hands. And then I was still in it when Twice takes over. So, so yeah, so, you know, that, that transition was really important. CBS, for me, came through my homies here in, uh, in Asheville, um, Wins and Cuddy and some of the Lord's guys like Ishmael and... Um, and foul and so yeah I, when they opened up the books uh for cbs i know that uh anger had hit up some of the guys out here and you know we're like you know hey you know guys have anybody who you are you interested in putting down and and they put me down graciously and um so i've been part of that crew ever since and and to be honest in all the crews the people who, who i gravitate around who i hang out with i would probably be hanging out with them anyways graffiti or not so like they're graffiti crews because we we like graffiti and we do graffiti and we paint and all that fun stuff but but i laugh when i see people like moving around in crews because mm -hmm. like for, for me like that's that's like it's like moving moving around your family i don't want to be family with you mm -hmm. today i don't like you today mm -hmm. so i'm gonna go for, i'm gonna go be family with the next guy you know right. and i'm not really that type of dude so so both of these crews i mean at least with stvwh i'm going on 30 to 25 years with them and then with cbs i'm almost Almost near a decade, so and that's a that's a long time, man, to be rocking. And thank you for rocking. Yeah. And those of yeah. you that are just joining us right now, you are live on Museum of Graffiti Art Talk with Trek Six. If you can please just take a moment and purchase a badge, show some support to the museum. If you haven't checked out the museum, the Saber exhibit is crazy. We were mm. just in there with Karis one last week. He was saying that this is the most official thing he's seen that represents graffiti. So you already know what it is. Bash what up, and we're gonna keep this thing moving, man. I hope y'all are having a great time. Pick up a badge and let's go. All right, so tell us a little bit about this piece. This, <laughs> now so, now so, you're moving into a big, you're, you're filling up walls by yourself now. Yeah, so you know, I've always done the commercial side of things. I mean, ever since I was 16, I, I think I even had my first formal letter from a professor being excused and to give, be giving me credit for traveling to do murals. So I've always kind of done this, but around here is when my wife starts to take over, um, sort of kind of like manage my, my, my business and helping me find gigs and stuff. And this is a church in Cooper City. Uh, they're called Potential, and they're partly sponsored by Volcom and by, by Red Bull, amazingly enough. Um, I went to a sermon and the pastor was getting a tattoo and everything, it was, it was bizarre, but but at the same time, those kids, they couldn't wait to come to church. There was like a skate ramp inside the, the, the church and everything. And uh, actually, this, is in, this one's in Asheville. Um, but anyhow, that, that, that was the first mural in which I was hired for a good amount of money, uh, hired several times over and over and over. And it started like make, making sense to me that I can do this for a living. This is from uh, the Foundation Skate Park in Asheville. Big up to push skateboards and brainstorm. Oh. How is the graffiti? How is graffiti different in Asheville than in Miami and some of the other places you've traveled? Oh man, um, that's a tough one because you know there are things about Miami graffiti that that I hate and love at the same time because I understand their necessity. So, like I think the level of of arguing and and fighting and just like I just think it's really a lot of a lot of nonsense and stupid, but. At the same time, you know, if you live in a jungle, you got to be aware of the lions. And so, mm -hmm. you know, I understand why people fight and I understand why they're armed and I get it. You live in that situation, you know, and so unfortunately, that's where it's at. And, you know, I don't like 
Huh? I mean, speaking of lions, right here we got one of the most <laughs> famous lions in the world on the right, screen, right. right? You've done a lot of work with the Bob Marley family. And so how did that connection happen? And, and how did you link up with the Marleys? Uh, well, you know, you know, you and I have known, you know, Kamani and some of these guys for forever, and Rohan since like Palmetto and, and all that. So I've, I've known them for a while. Um, that, that came about when uh, Ziggy did uh, the Messenger exhibition in uh, History of Miami. And they wanted to include the Love is a Mural. And they were interested if I would be in, if I would do some portraits in their lobby. And so I did, I think it was a total of, um, it's like 70 something feet worth of, of, of work in like four days. And my wife was pregnant with my son and we knocked it out and it came out beautiful. And in that scene there, uh, you can't really see it, but that's Kamani all the way in the front singing. Um, and those are people with their cell phones out. So it's, it's his father looking onto his son, watching his son carry on his legacy and everybody witnessing this in front of my mirror. I thought it was like a really precious that, moment. That is deep, man. Thank you. And you know, just real quick, Trek touched on our crew Plan Beats. I want to acknowledge Terms and KV because years, probably in the late nineties, when we were working with the Marley family, we got uh, Terms and KV did a huge train, coming home to Zion Train and Bob Marley, um, Backdrop at for the Bayside front, so big up that crew as well. Yeah. Rock and yeah. now, I've continued to do work with them. Um, last year before last, I painted Tough Gong Studios. Um, I also did another portrait of Bob uh, at his house on Hope, and so I've continued to work, work with them. This is with a really great project called Raw, uh, where we uh, try to create funding and beautify schools that are uh, underfunded and mistreated by their school boards. That one's in Denver in particular. Um, yeah, man, I love that project. Love it. That is a place on an Isle of Pata. And that, I painted that during Zika. I remember the planes flying over me and I was supposed to be getting nailed to death or something. Uh, <laughs> I like this mural a lot though, because it, it, I mean, too bad it's a far away shot. There's a, an, an immense amount of technique in that um, once you get up close to it, you know, from the glazing on the eyes, the way the flares of the flower pop out and how it reflects on the skull, the drapery turning into the mountains. I mean, I, I, I mix in the realism with using a lot of rhythmic and line and contour work with textural work. So, you know, I kind of threw everything with the kitchen sink at that one. No doubt, no doubt. Now, okay, <laughs> hold on. I can't, I can't even show uh, this yet because Miami, what up Shia, you are in the building. Miami, listen, this is the most famous wall I think this and the one that's coming after are probably the two most famous walls. And I feel like there was a time track where you definitely had the most pieces running in Wynwood, probably at the height of Wynwood. And um, it's not taking anything away from anyone. I'm just talking about quantity, not quality. And I'm not saying your stuff isn't quality, it's, it's dope. But this wall right here represents Miami. People see this and they know it's a Miami landmark. How did how did that go about? Like you created a Miami landmark that every year is being updated, and I mean, yep. tell us a little bit about this. So so this is this is my uh, my 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 best and my worst. This this mural and I have been fighting for years. Um, you know, this was originally painted by Sony for a primary flight, uh, and it was like a play school model version. Like it looked like the primary colors and stuff like that, uh, and. Uh, big up to Arthur, that's his in the back from Low Life Crew. Um, and so, yeah, he had done it. And then it rode maybe for like a year. And for Basil, and, and I might be wrong, but I believe it was Secret, Airborne, Chaos, and a couple of the, of, of the old school Miami cats took it from him. Uh, and it, and But they did like these murals that were like six feet down. And then they did these huge um, like logos on top. And that ran maybe for like five months. And at the end of five months, that was like all tattered. Like, you know, I mean, you know how things are, in Wynwood, especially back then when there was like no lights out there at that time, there was nothing. And so it was like just dusted. And uh, I, I was hanging out with Chor at the time and Chor was painting the youth fair and he was done and he was in Kendall and he was bored. He's like, come pick me up, Trek. And so Lizzie and I picked him up and we're walking by the, you know, checking out what, what Airborne and these cats had done. And um, long story short, we were approached and decided to, with a little nudge also from Lizzie, um, to put a boombox back. Uh, it 
was like it, it just it was just one of those things that just it, it, i can't picture anything else there you know what i'm saying like i'm sure we could put other stuff there but anybody who at least grew up in miami in the era that i grew up in you know understands the relevance to having that icon there and also for me it was something that represented my generation because there's just lots of like brilliant art pieces that are have to do with miami all over you know but none of them come from my hood you know and they don't come from my peoples and so and graffiti is the only way that we can do that so you know me and troll like yo we're gonna we're gonna put back a boom box we're gonna put it back and we're gonna try to keep it running that's the goal we're gonna try to keep it running so we put it up uh, and it was in march that we put it up and i've been you know we, it's been a lot of work i mean you'd be surprised the early days we used to have to pay people to come over lawn um we've had you know call the city to turn the lights on um you don't know the amount of times that i've had to go and buff it and clean it uh, you, know, you know not to mention all the other you know stuff that happens with murals that become very popular and the, the misuse and appropriation of the work so yeah we, we i've kept it up for 10 years in the sixth year sixth year i believe it was um chore went to africa that year instead of coming to basel and um you know being that in winwood if you blink you lose your walls uh, i don't want to lose this one and i felt like pressure and so uh so i invited ishmael from north carolina to come join me and the reason i had invited somebody that's not from miami is because part of the politics of this wall is that it was designed to both showcase the local and the out of towner and say that side by side the two of us can sit you know and and, and work together you know equally and so um so yeah so you know there always had to be a local and an out of towner on 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 this wall and since shore couldn't make it the next person in line for me was was ish because ish was a worker bee um ish is from the graph background believe it or not he's actually from miami um and and the guy's work is impeccable and i loved his attitude and and i love that he was he was real graph he was real graph anyone who knows ish knows knows exactly what i'm talking about and and i needed that i needed that i needed that in my life i wanted that on the wall um chore wasn't wasn't available you know to to do the work and and i needed i needed the work i needed somebody you know who can hang on this level um and he did i mean and there it is i i, I want to big up one time you put WVUN, you know, 90.5, yes. Power 96, yes. 99 yes. Jams, 100.1, yes. Hot 105. I mean, these are these yes. are the days that represented our childhood. Yes. So big I up, mean, man. there's so much symbolism in this mural that people might even go over their heads. But, you know, yeah, that's what that's one of them. Those were all the, the radio stations that I grew up listening to, that we grew up listening to when people had radios. Um, I, I, you know, there's a few other little ones here and there, but those were the ones that you always had, like on the dial, you know. Word. I mean, and y'all are this piece is so iconic. I feel like this is. I think I've read somewhere that's the most photographed wall in all of Winwood. I, I, w I would. I don't know. I think the boombox is probably more photographed than this one. At least, at least from what I have to do in terms of like you know dealing with the back end of things, I have to deal more with the headaches. But this one in particular. Um, we didn't have to deal a lot with that because I don't own Bob's image. So, whereas the boom box, we own all the rights. We could do, you know, different things with that. This one is different. We can't really do that um, because of Bob. And so we've never, you know, attempted to really <clears throat> make any money or anything off of it. Everything, anything we've done with this has always been on a promotional tip. And, um, and big, 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 big thank you to Heck One. Um, this wall, I had gotten it a couple of years before and I had done it with Celso Gonzalez and Don Rymix and it rode for a while, but then, um, the guy who had the property, he was, uh, complaining that the black background was making his, uh, electricity go up. And so, so I started repainting it and, um, I had had hernia surgery, like halfway through it. And, uh, they reached out, I guess, you know, in my recovery, somebody who worked for him reached out to heck and had invited heck on the wall. And then when I came back, it was like this whole, you know, moment of like, oh, but, you know, we told you this, we told you that. And I was like, look, heck is an old school cat from Miami. Um, he still paints. So, yeah, let's do it. Let's just, you know, let's just work together. And uh, we met. And I, I, at first, I didn't want to really do the loveism thing because I felt it was just like straight branding. But, um, but I felt that the message itself and being able to see those words and that such clean, crisp typography from 95 psychologically has to do something you know 
Um, so from, 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 an, from an artsy fartsy point of view, it really interested me. Uh, and that inspired me to look for, to look for an icon to paint that uh, you couldn't really hate on, you know? Uh, at first I wanted to paint, you know, Lenin, but there are lots of things about po po politically about Lenin that just were kind of like, uh, you know, I don't know. But with Bob, uh, overall, it's pretty hard to hate Bob, you know? He, 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 the guy just encompasses love and light. And, and so I figured him looking at the clouds was the perfect way to reach out to 95 and, um, and kind of psychologically twist their, their second while they drive past that mural. Thank you, Shrek. And for those of you just joining us, this is Art Talk, Museum of Graffiti. We are going live. It's not a joke. We are live with Trek 6. If you can please show us some love and support by purchasing a badge, we greatly appreciate it. Mayor, thank you for all what you've done for the graffiti community. We see you in here. And everybody, thank you for joining and rocking it. We're going to keep it going, man. We are live, Trek 6. So this now you, you, you talked earlier about your Puerto Rico roots. How has that yeah. influenced your art over time? Uh, anything that you've seen from me prior to 2000 is one thing. After 2000, is completely different. Um, when I was in Puerto Rico, most of it, I actually, I did music and did art, uh, sound art. But at the beginning, I went there for uh, the University of uh, Arte Plástica in San Juan. And big up to everybody in that crew, because from that, that year, you have Big, you have Rymix. Uh, following year, you have Alex Diaz and um, La Pandilla, Celso Gonzalez. I mean, just the amount of talent that came out of that year is, is amazing. But um, one of the things that I noticed that the Puerto Ricans were doing with their aerosol art is, yeah, that's, that's where the Bob Marley was, the loveism. This was before the loveism there. Um, in Puerto Rico, they were mixing their culture a lot, but not pop culture. I was used to, and again, this is, I, I live a, a graffiti life with blindfolds on. I don't really look at a whole lot of people. So if, I, if, if this is incorrect, you have to understand it's my point of view. But um, so yeah, I didn't really see uh, graffiti people mixing too much of their, their native cultures. It was always more like pop culture, pop culture references, which was awesome, um, but didn't feel the same as what I was seeing from the Puerto Ricans and the Peruvians who were mixing in a lot of like their indigenous culture and things that were, you know, indicative of their, of their people. And so once I leave Puerto Rico and start painting again, especially with spray paint, you start seeing me include a lot of things like offering to orishas and women dancing dressed in white and, you know, uh, more very specific iconography um, linking Puerto Rico. And this is for uh, the first uh, Winwood uh, Festival, Winwood Life Festival, which I actually, and that's actually the end result of an animation. Um, I don't know if everybody's, anybody's seen that guy, Blue, who does the animations where with the, they buff and do all that. It's kind of like that, but I don't buff, you know, instead it, it looks like, like traditional cell animation, um, but it's done on the wall, frame by frame with spray paint, which is incredibly tedious. Uh, that's Canvas Miami. It's a condo. Um, 75 feet of colors. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And I see you have, so you, you definitely have like a similar color palette and a lot of your pieces have this kind of flow, this water-like flow. Mm -hmm. When did you develop that and what does that represent to you? I started doing that in 2002, I want to say, um, in sketchbooks at first. Uh, I, in Puerto Rico, one of my mentors was Andy Hueso. He's an old school painter. And um, he used to always jo you know, joke around with me about, about the, the way that graffiti writers will never use contour line because he always saw things very graphic. Remember, this is an older guy, so what he remembers uh, of, of graffiti and all that is early New York days. So where everything's very blocky and whatnot, I guess, from his point of view. And so he always like, like say that you know, graffiti writers will never be as great as like the contour line. And so I started using contour line more and more and more and more in my work. Um, and so that, that line work are just different manifestations of the use of the co uh, of the, the contour line. I also noticed that guys like, for instance, like uh, like Chore, like A Hole, um, Cause, Slick, they all all these guys have like this like icon that instantly recognizes you know who they are. You know, with, with mm -hmm. Slick, you have the little the three little white hands, and you know, with Chore, you have the boogie birds and things like that. And I didn't want to do a character because I, I, I just didn't want to do it. But I felt that, that having um, an aesthetic of contour lines 
that create some sort of rhythmic motion be something that's consistent in my work would help people identify me. So that's why, the, but they've been there since like 2002 or so. Mm. Nice. And that's and so this here work. is a that's collaboration. <laughs> who is, who, tell us about this collaboration. Here. Uh, that, that was for Collective. Um, I don't know exactly how how we got to Carlos. I could have been Lisa Leon, reached out to Lizzie. I don't remember exactly, but um, he needed a space to exhibit some of his uh, sculptures. And uh, for Basil, we had 8,000 square feet. And um, so, yeah, why not, right? You know, they were brilliant. They were, I mean, who wouldn't want to exhibit that? And, and during Collective, every artist had like uh, their own spot to paint. And then there was like all these other areas where people could just, you know, you could just throw up uh, whatever you want. And because that was a little small corner, a lot of people avoided it. And um, at the time I was try I was really into that, like, that whole 3D, you know, uh, multiple point perspectives and things like that. And it just looked really well with, you know, the way Carlos's flow went, you know, I, th I thought it was really nice. If I, if I would have known earlier though, where he was gonna place it, I probably would have dropped some better shadows on the, on the actual uh, letters so it to look good, but. And for those of you that don't know, when he's mentioning Carlos, he's talking about Mayor One of the Time, original hip hop pioneer of the graffiti art culture, also a big supporter of the Museum of Graffiti. So thank you for your contribution, Mayor. All right, man. Yeah. So, I mean, again, this is this is this looks like Puerto Rico when you look at it. I mean, you got the. That, coolest, I mean, that's right? that's just, so. This is like my first large scale mural in Wynwood. Uh, big up to Josh Cohn. This was in the Cohn compound. Um, I would say this was around 2010, something like that. And we still had Puerto Ricans living like next to the Panther at the time, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so when I did this mural, I noticed, again, I look around and what I see is, you know, people painting pretty ladies that look like models and I see, you know, animals and all this stuff, but I don't see, I don't see my, my culture, my people. And, and my Puerto Ricans, and, and I knew that this is a Puerto Rican neighborhood, you know, like, why, why are we seeing any of this on this side of town? So, Soñando Despierto is a, is a very uh, well-known um, salsa song, and it just means daydreaming. And so you see the girl daydreaming of the coqui frog, and, and uh, um, you, you see there O San Juan and Morro and uh, Rey Barreto playing the, the congas. And it was just my way of imagining you know, a, a woman in, in Wynwood thinking of, of Puerto Rico, like just like daydreaming of what island life would be like. And it was something that I wanted the people who lived across the street at to enjoy. Because that's the other thing. I don't think a lot of cats think about who, who lives in these neighborhoods and has to stare at this stuff all day, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I think there, there should be some level of context to that. And so I, I knew that everybody that faced this wall, they were it was all Puerto Ricans. And I knew that they're old school cats, you know, older Puerto Rican cats, so they would appreciate something like that. Yeah, we used to rock the block parties right across the street from them, and they would hold us down. Yeah, right. This is uh, this was part of Santurce Slay, I think four. Uh, I'm originally from Santurce. This is around the corner from El Watusi, which is a very famous uh, bar, and that's Ismael Rivera, who's from that town. Who I'm from that town. We used to drink at that bar, and again, I try to place things in context, you know. So that's why you see Ismael there, because that's where he's from. If you're from that area, you knew or your parents knew who this cat was, you know, even if he wasn't famous. And so they can walk down this, this street and see and still see their peoples. Again, I'm, I'm very sensitive to that. I don't know why, but I feel like, uh, you know, if, if I'm going to travel and put, you know, street art or murals or whatever, you know, when I talk about graphic, we're talking about like murals you know, up in people's faces like this, I have some level of responsibility, I think, you know. So yeah. this is <laughs> this is a neighbor, neighborhood off of Biscayne. It's a really fancy, fancy, I don't know if it's Bell Mead kind of area. Um, but yo, so this guy hit me up and saw some of my 3D renders that I do on my computers and was interested in me painting that on his house. And I was <laughs> like, yeah, and I was like, for sure, they're gonna, they're gonna make you paint over it like before I'm even done. He's like, no, nah, do it. Don't worry about it. And yeah, I think it's still even there. And the, and that's before it was done. The mural actually goes down the floor and onto the garage. Like the, I was just starting it when I did it. It goes down all those blocks and everything onto the road. And it's just um, it's just 3D abstract renders that I used to do. Oh, Morningside, as he said, it's Morningside area. So, oh, it's one of my favorites.
I like that one. What is it that you like uh, most about it? Uh, you know, I like the moment when it happened. I like the people I was around and the attitude that they had at that moment. Um, it just captured a really, really beautiful Art Basel. You know, Art Basel, each one is like a monster. It has its own machine, its own attitude, own set of events, good and bad, that happen. You know, it's almost like each one is its own hangover movie. Um, and this is Hangover 1 for me. You know, this is the best one. You know, and um, so this is a, a, a lot of people don't know I'm a musician. I played bass in a band called Oruga uh, out of Puerto Rico. A big up to Ashula de of Yoruba Records. You'll see him in the back there. Uh, we did a lot of a lot of stuff. You know, we were a very uh, cutting edge band, and we did a lot of a lot of stuff that nowadays you know seems simple and everyone doing. But they asked me MC with Plan B. MC, do you remember my remember what happened rocks. that night? Do you remember what happened that night? No, you got to you got to refresh. This is the memory. thing. I, I've been gifted with an insanely accurate memory. So check this out. Right at that moment, I'm emceeing, right? Uh, I can't remember whose backyard it is, but it was, it was near Arvida. And someone threw, someone threw a smoke bomb over the fence. I don't know who did it. And someone yelled, yelled out, fire. And everyone took off running. There was a guy that we used to call Slaw. Do you remember him? Slaw? Yeah. yeah. No. There was this big, big, big dude that went to kill him. We used to call him Slaw. Mm -hmm. Slaw went running and hit the fence and knocked it over. And apparently there was some kings on the other side. Mm -hmm. And everybody started, you know, wilding out. Mm -hmm. Now, back then I had a bit of a drinking issue. And so I had, you don't see it, but I had down the floor like a whole bottle of Johnny Walker, which I had been just steadily drinking the whole night. The smoke is going off, everybody's running. I'm drunk as hell in the middle of it yelling, I'll fight anyone, I don't care, I don't care. You know, drunk like an idiot. And then Gordon grabs me and he's like, dude, this is not this is not the good look. And he throws me in the back of your Bronco. You remember your Bronco? You had that blue Bronco? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he throws me in the black, back of the Bronco, and he's like, yo, take care of Trek. He's talking too much crap. He's drunk. He's going to get hurt. <laughs> and we sped off. I don't know where we, where we went to, but that was like literally the end of the show. And we, what was funny is, as all this is happening, we're also trying to pick up Rook's equipment because Rook was DJing. So there's all these fights breaking out. Smoke bomb throwing smoke everywhere. People running like crazy, like morons. And we're trying to pick up Rook's equipment. I'm drunk challenging everyone. I, 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 to be honest, there might have not been anybody in front of me. I might have been just talking to myself out loud. Um, and, and then I just remember G throwing me in the back of your, uh, of your pickup and taking off. That's but hilarious. That photo was taken like maybe five minutes before all that happened. And then also, so I, I know skating yeah, was very... Backside, so backside nose bone. Yeah, well, you can't front on that. That's an ollie. That's off an ollie. And how has skating an ollie over influenced... all kinds of stuff? Was that how has skateboard culture kind of influenced your art, or do you see them as like what do you see as the similarities so, between the two? So do you remember the characters that, that I was that we talked about earlier on that I freestyled? Yes. So yep. let me just give a shout out to a couple of people real quick to explain what that question. Big shout out to Mech, Mir, DK, and a guy named Jose Gomez. So. DK had a really ill character vibe, and 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 I had you know I don't care what people say when I when I was starting to write, I was really on Mech's work like I really like Mech's work a lot, uh, and I was kind of mentoring with Mir, so we were doing all these like like characters and stuff, and I met this kid Jose Gomez because we used to all skate at Friday Night Raps, which is where also because because coincidentally is where I met twice, and Jose Gomez was just a skater kid, but he did all these ill characters that looked like graffiti characters. That he had learned also from looking at you know guys like like Mir and, and and DK, and Jose ended up I guess working with New Deal, or got sponsored by New Deal, and him and Andy Howe clicked up and started like painting and you know, doing all the New Deal stuff, all like all their skateboard um, artwork, and it was the first time that I mean it wasn't the first time because there's all there was Tribal, there was Con Art, there was all these things, but those were all from like West Coast places or North you know. New and, you know New York and all that. It was the first time that somebody who I knew, like you know, six degrees type stuff, that had got put on and had brought like a stylistic graffiti thing that I, you know, I, I thought was like from our hood, you know, out and out to the open. And it just started really cementing to me, you know, the possibilities of, of what you can do with this stuff. Like I, I, you know, I remember immediately going back to Ringling because I went to school at Ringling School of Art and Design, and uh, and and 
using some of those like same techniques that DK would use to how he cut his how he would cut his characters um, and the two tones that he would use for his skin color and stuff like that and, and just like below these art kids minds with my you know really crappy rendition of these other you know Miami legends but uh, that's a working spray can um, done for the people at a swarm swarm agency in Linwood if y'all can see how big it is I mean right here it's about six six or seven feet tall yeah uh, hold on one second okay if you see we zoom in right here you can see how you know yeah. that's a real can there so six feet yeah they got a whole crazy they got a crazy pressure valve system and they hit a switch and it sprays out and you know i'm an old cat i don't really i'm i'm pretty much an anti-social person so i've never seen it in the actual application <laughs> i've only seen it you know on the ground level when i go and paint it you know but from what i heard they, they bring them out at, at night when they do the big events there and for those of you just checking in right now, we are live with Trek 6. You are on Art Talk, Museum of Graffiti. Please show your support by picking up a badge. It's greatly appreciated because your support enables us to tell the story, document, and archive Miami's hip-hop writing story. We thank you so much. And we're going to keep it moving with Trek 6, y'all. Here it is. So this, this is a very unique yeah. you see graffiti writer getting into pottery. Tell us about this. So for a couple of years, I was signed to a gallery called LNS. And um, and they introduced me to another uh, another studio Ache, which was another gallery from another gentleman I believe works at Go at the Goldman now, um, and he was out of Nicaragua and he was interested in mixing street art with uh, traditional ceramic hand painting, and um, he had this artist by the last name of Maldonado who did these traditional hand paintings. He had worked a little bit with Libo, um, but you know it, it, you know Libo's work and my work in terms of like the line work is it's very different, and so. I, I sent him some paintings and I said, look, okay, let's, you know, let's see, let's see what, 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 what it's going to look like. And man, this guy, I mean, whoo, I, we've got five of them and he went in. I mean, that's all done by hand. The, it's all, uh, you know, handcrafted uh, ceramics painted by hand. And there's all kinds of like textural things that he did. I mean, the guy was just, just amazing how he was able to, you know, take my paintings. And those those particular references are paintings from a solo show um, where I recreated Puerto Rican uh, petroglyphs. And nice. so that, that petroglyph in particular is uh, the goddess of fertility. And um, yeah, you can see like the moon cycles over her face and <clears throat> things like that. Nice. All right. That's some digital work. Believe it out, that's actual lettering. Um, since about 2000 or so i started working a lot on like how i can re contextualize lettering in digital formats and so i used to make all these like short little animated um flicks on cinema 4d where i would take like basic lettering and then just stretch and pull them out like to the point of absurdity um still they're still letters but now at this point they just take on a completely different life um later on many 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 years later it's called an nft but when I did this, it was just me messing around on a computer and I would make these short little loops out of it and um, just trying to imagine letter, a different lettering format, something that looked more alien and abstract. No doubt. And since we, you know, since we did have a Here's little bit one. of technical issue, we're going to, you know, we're going to run a little bit over time just to make up for the technical issue. So we're, is this another digital rendering? Yeah, it's another digital rendering. Um, again, it's just me taking letters and um, and just blowing them up using different uh, effects that you would uh, for geometry in uh, 3D software. I'm a three, I'm, a lot of people don't realize this, but I, I have a bachelor's in 3D animation. So I, I studied at Ringling School of Art Design and at Full Sail. And, and what, um, what, what programs do you use and what's the difference between going on a wall and working on your computer? I mean, there's a lot, a lot, a lot different. Uh, but I will say that, that when I, the working on the computer has helped me organize how I work on walls, how I layer, how I do what in what order. Um, I, you know, it, working with programs like Photoshop and stuff like that, where you work in layers, uh, has helped me arrange myself a little bit better, which makes me really, really, really efficient. Um, and working with 3D software and using artificial lighting has helped me also understand better uh, shadowing. So because it, it's so technical, the 3D stuff, it, 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 ends, it ends up embedding in your brain and, and it transfers into how you perceive 
you know, uh, two-dimensional as well when you're working with paint. This is Behike. That's the, the Taino word for shaman. Our people yeah. used to take uh, this snuff to visit uh, our gods, and that's him communicating right there. And so where, did you ever get involved in illegal graffiti? What are your views on illegal graffiti versus I love you know, all the legal? Huh? I, love, I love illegal graffiti. I got nothing bad to say about it. You know, it's, it, you know a lot of times I, I have to have that conversation with people, especially in the corporate industry. And, you know, I get it. It is, it is legal and you're riding on somebody's property and you're defacing it. That's wrong and it's against the law. But th the thing is this, though. It, I think I'm a real stickler for words and, and it's the words we use. So, you know, graffiti itself, the word, is, it, if you go to a copy and say, what's graffiti? He's not going to show you a legal mural. He's going to show you something else. So it's really clear to find what it is. And um, I like it. I don't got no problems with it. I, the problems that I have with graffiti have to do have to do more with 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 other BS that comes with it, you know, because it's such a, a testosterone, ego driven machine, you know. And I don't mean that from a negative point of view. It just is what it is. I mean, if you're gonna play ball, you're gonna play football, right? You know you're gonna have to tackle. You know you're gonna get hurt, right? And so graffiti's not to me growing up the way I was raised in graffiti is not any different. Um, so I, I love graffiti. I got no problems against it. Uh, it sucks when it ha happens to you. Um, it has happened to me. It sucks, you know, and I have to, at that point, bite my lip and be like, oh, you know, but, um, but I like to look at it. And I still do my thing on the side. It's just, you know, big up to comp. I was with comp once and he made a real funny comment um, that stuck with me. He, had, he was putting up these stickers and we were like literally in the middle of nowhere where nobody was going to ever see this stuff. I'm like, why are you wasting your money putting up, you know, these stickers here? He's like, that's where I get my off on, knowing that nobody's going to see it, but maybe that one day somebody's going to come by and I'm going to be right here. And, you know, at that point, you know, graffiti changed for me. I don't really do it for fame or to do graffiti like, like I did when I was much younger, like some of my homies do that. They really like, this is, they're pushing it. They're pushing it. They're pushing it. You know, me now, it's more for like, like shits and giggles and fun. You know, when I go and travel, when I'm with the homies, you know, when I got a break, I catch a tag, I don't do something like that. You know, it's more genuine for me that way than to try to push it, push it, push it, because it just, that doesn't fit in the realm of my world and responsibilities right now. So. No doubt. And yo, those of you just joining us right now, we are live with Trek 6. This is Museum of Graffiti Art Talks. I'm going to run this little video for you to see. He was talking about graffiti animation, so check it, check it out. We got the toast bill. If you're familiar with blue, the guy who does the, the, the animations, you'll get this. actual making of it. I mean, y'all got to show some love yeah. for that, man. That's absolutely incredible. So that's, that's like traditional based at cell animation um, directly on the wall. So when you see it grow like that, I'm literally moving the line one inch at a time. So I, I, wow. I draw like an inch of it. And then I step back and take a picture. Well, I didn't step back. I had Mar my, my, my homie Mario from Toast Films in Puerto Rico, who I work with quite a bit. And, you know, I had done animation before, you know, uh, as a profession and understand how frames work 
you know? Mm -hmm. uh, again, we were talking about how the digital influences. And so, yeah, with, with, with you know, understanding that, I was like, you know what? I bet if I could just move it a little bit at a time, I could make it look like it's growing. Because a lot of ways that these people do these type of animations is they buff behind the, the sketch to make the line disappear. But you'll always see the buff mark, which I thought I was like, ah, uh, you know, like that's cool. And if, if it's infinite, it opens up an infinite possibilities, but, but it leaves the mark behind, which I didn't like. And so I, I figured that if I did it this way, then it's in San Dulce, um, that I could, you know, make the whole thing grow. So it literally took us from nine o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock at night just to do that little bit of animation. Um, and I just worked nonstop. I didn't, I didn't stop at all, like literally the whole entire time. And then you walk forward and you move it a little bit. And you step out of the frame, you take a picture. Then you move it a little bit. And you step out of the frame, you take a picture. And so, you know, 30 frames equals one second. Word. So, so you know. That's amazing. Man. We got about 10 minutes left. I, I know we have another video I'd like to get into right now. But y'all show Trek some love because this work is absolutely amazing. This is another, uh, another animation as well I did in my studio. This is the music from my band, Oruga. Yo, big up for Mech to Mech for that K. <laughs> This is just me finishing up the mural. Yeah, that music sexy. As you said, you do music, you're into music. So did you do any of the music for any of these tracks? That last one, that's me. Okay, dope, dope. Yeah. And so, again, yeah, that, we, that, that's also a hand, uh, cell by cell animation. That one took, I did it, and that, that one I did completely by myself, which that's why halfway through I stop and just do time lapse. Uh, you, you don't, I, it's really hard to do that. <laughs> you know, to be that guy painting and stepping back and running the camera. And so after about 18 hours, I was like, look, man, what, whatever we got is what we got. And uh, I'm calling it quiz because this is too hard for me to do on my own. You right. know, and then I just take it back into, into the computer and pop it all back together and, and, and see how it looks like in forward motion. Yeah, so there it is, man. We got Trek 6 in the building. We just got a few minutes left. And this must be one of your most outrageous gigs, right? Can you tell us what you know that you're doing? This is one of my favorite things that I've done, and I, it's one that least people know about. Um, so as far as I, what I was told, I'm the first live painter, street artist, graffiti artist, whatever, to ever paint the runway, runway in New York. And what happened is I was doing some work with Ranjana Khan, whose husband is Naeem Khan, a very famous uh, fashion designer who does, uh, like, for instance, the Michelle Obama's inaugural dress and stuff like that. Uh, you know, he's, he's a very important person in the fashion industry. And uh, he had seen some work, and he was having his 10-year uh, anniversary of being on the runway, uh, the winter runway, for Fashion Week. And he wanted, you know, me to do this huge background. And originally, we had, he wanted me to, like, to do this, like, number 10, you know, like, for 10 years. And, you know, we had talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. And I went to I went to New York. We got the paints and everything. And it's the night before the the show. And I'm just like Naeem, I'm not feeling it. And he's like, What do you mean? I'm like, I think it's gonna come off like 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 you know Disney, to celebrate 10 years with Disney thing. And I'm like, I think that's kind of corny. I'm like, Can you just trust me with something? <laughs> and he looked me dead in the eye. And this is what the homie says. He's like, I trust you, but if you mess up, that's the end of your career. <laughs> just, <laughs> just like that. No, no pressure. He's like, and not just that, but while you're painting it, they're going to be installing a $10 million Swarovski diamond crystal uh, um, 
like a veil behind you. So you also can't get any pain on top of that. Wow. So I was like, oh man. So I said, look, I have this idea. I'm just gonna bomb a canvas. And he's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I'm just gonna write over it, over and over and over. He's ready to write. I'm like, I don't know, I'm gonna write track, I'm gonna write my cruise. He's like, well, can you write my name? I'm like, yes. And so the exhibition was with Naeem Khan and with Chris Lebutin, who does the uh, red bottom shoes. And uh, they have it. We, we, like I said, I've flown out there and I did this like an hour before, uh, well, I did a little bit the night before. And then like an hour before uh, the runway, I touched it up a little bit more and they were kind of like, yeah, you can finish it. You know, once the runway show starts and then lo and behold, I start working and the runway show started as I'm painting. Which I, you know, <laughs> so I had to quickly dive, dive out of the way and all these runway models start coming out and stuff. But it was beautiful. It, it's, it's about 30 feet tall by 35 feet wide. Um, accomplished in under four or five hours, I think, total work. Um, and, and it literally just says, Trek 6, STV, WH, CBS, Naeem Khan, and Chris, because you know one of the last names too damn long, so Chris. And it just, it, we just, I just layered it over and 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 over. That's it until so like, it just took on its own little like view, you know, it was its own textural thing. Um, and now I, I, I've been doing more and more of that type of stuff lately, uh, just because I just like it. I like it. Uh, so many years painting portraits and stuff where I have to worry about certain technique uh, when you do caricatures and portraits. If uh, the nostrils an inch off, it's the difference between looking like Michael Jackson and Diana Ross, you know. And so, you know, I, 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 it's tense when I do portraits. No, it's tension. Tense. It's anxiety. It's not. It's it's not fun. Yeah, this is a good one. So we're we're coming to the end of the time. of the interview. If y'all have any questions for our brother Trek Six, yeah. drop it in the chat. Um, Dunn One was asking, what year was that? So we said 2014, 2015. Um, if y'all have some questions for my brother, please drop it in the chat. This is yeah. Trek Six, STV crew. Can, can, can I mention coming? Crew, can I mention w coming home? Because I, I think people Absolutely. Would appreciate please that. do it. So I've been involved in a set of documentaries. I'm going to try to make it quick because I know time's going. I've been involved in a set of documentaries the last couple of years uh, called Coming Home. I've been a part of this. Uh, big shout outs to Crazy Hood and Air DJ EFN for making me a part of that family. And uh, we've been going to different countries around the world and exploring the hip hop culture and the roots in those countries while exploring those countries themselves. Um, they did Cuba, uh, they did Peru, Haiti, and then I jumped on board uh, on Vietnam, Colombia, and we just premiered uh, or we just did a screening of South Africa last month or this past month. Uh, so, you know, be on the lookout. We just, we just signed now, we're rocking with Rock the Bells. They're gonna start doing all the promotional work now for coming home. And so if you go to the Rock the Bells uh, YouTube channel, you'll be able to see, you know, all of the coming homes. But I think uh, right now they're up to Vietnam. And then after that, I don't know if they're gonna show Colombia or Africa just yet, because they might be sitting on that one for a minute. Yeah, man, but, big up DJ EFN, Crazy Hill Productions, who have been down the Miami Kendall hip hop scene forever. Seemed like it's definitely as long as we have, you know, and yeah. it's just amazing to see so many people come out of Kendall. I mean, in closing thoughts, Kendall hip hop. I mean, yeah. Kendall is really on the map, and there's, I mean, Craze comes from Kendall, it's, it's, EFN comes from weird. Kendall. There's so, much, there, there, there's so much that comes from the, like that Kendall Parai nook. You know, and yeah. you can extend it a little bit further down south to Cutler Ridge and maybe a little bit further up, you know, Westchester, uh, South Miami, you know, but that little nook, at least for me, there was a lot of power there. And I, I, I can't say this in reference to other areas further north, because, you know, and, and you brought this up to me is at least for us, our graffiti legacy had to do with the Metro Rail, you know, like the Metro Rail dictated a lot of what we saw and what we didn't see and whatnot. And so, you know, my heroes were all from the South and we, it just seemed like everybody was just challenging each other to, to do more, you know? Like there was like a good, I don't know, I wouldn't say 10 years or I don't know the exact number of years it was, but it just felt like there was a moment where at, at least in this culture, everybody was pushing. Everybody was really just, and it wasn't like grinding. Like I hear people say grind nowadays and I can't stand that word, I can't stand it. You know, cause it, it, it almost feels like it has no purpose. Like, I'm just grinding. I'm not grinding. I'm developing. And that's what we were doing. We were developing. And in Kendall, there was a lot. And after Hurricane Andrew, it just seemed like it got even more. You yes. know, it's like people became more desperate because we didn't have, because our houses were destroyed or whatever. 
lawlessness, whatever the situation is, mm-hmm. but the amount of creativity that blossomed um, Kendall post 92. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, yeah. They got yeah. STV looters in 1992. That's right, that's right. That's right. Twice as right. On 88. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yo, that brings us to a close. Before we get out of here, though, if somebody, anybody, everybody, please just purchase a badge. This is Trek 6. Any last questions from my brother? Uh, you have any last words you'd like to share with the people? Ah, uh, man. No, I mean, you know, I do, I do interviews, and I, sometimes I feel like I say too much, too much. No, you know, my, my message for people is, can we, can we, just, can we just be cool? Cool. Like, 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 just that, can we just be cool? I mean, that's, with, with, with all sincerity and in all fullness. You know, I, I, I right now live in the mountains, really removed from everyone. And, um, and every time I get near society, it just seems like people have lost the ability to just be cool with each other. And so, yeah. Yo, you know, the, so, the, uh, no, I know, the, chat, I the, the people in the chat are wilding right now. I know, I know. It's crazy. <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely a trip down memory lane. Please make sure you follow Trek6 on Instagram. You can check him on his website. Thank you so much for supporting, you know, Art Talk, Museum of Graffiti. Pick up a badge. Thank you for rocking with us. Can't stop. Won't stop. stop. Peace, y'all. Stop the violence. Yeah.